The weekdays pass. By now, there is usually no contact during the week. He has a rich email life, he tells me, but I have no internet connection and no desire to get one, even though he has urged me to, if only so that we could communicate between weekends. But I'm a talker, a phone person, and he isn't. David used to call me from his office several times a day, too much for me, actually, though I admit that I was gratified by this and other signs of his childlike attachment to me, his dependency. The calls were boring. He would talk about his work, office politics, but he was happy when I would relate this to the path, to the entry-level New Age doctrine that was our common ground. He wanted me to do this. He loved to be lectured to, to be taught, and I could admit that I deeply appreciated this about him his honest humility, his easy recognition of my superiority and willingness to benefit from it, to be educated and raised. It was a strong bond between us, which went a long way to compensating for my irritation and boredom with his stupidity. In the early days, Ben would call too, but again, there were the long silences of our first calls, which grew increasingly tiresome to me as a sign of social retardation as much as of deep thought. Sometimes he would deliberately call when he knew I was likely to be out, and leave short statements, usually declarations of love, on my answering machine, or quotations from his reading. Sometimes he would mail me letters or postcards, and they were always beautiful. He really cannot write anything, even the simplest thing, without making it beautiful. He still does this, sometimes, but not so far this week. I know myself, a ludicrous understatement, so I am fully aware of my loneliness, the social emptiness of my life, precious though the inter independence and autonomy of solitude are to me. After the divorce, the settlement, unjustly small though it was, nevertheless allowed me to avoid the necessity of returning to the hell realm of office work that I had briefly inhabited in the gap between quitting my first year at university and meeting my future husband in that same office. I live frugally, so much so that I was even able to go back to university and complete my BA during the first years after the divorce, the years with David. That gave me a lot to do here during the week. And then there were the weekends at David's condominium, and frequent weeknights out with him, films and suppers at expensive restaurants, and the trips, the cruises to Cancun, the holidays in Baja, California. David had money. So did Steve, being a doctor and being from a patrician background. He too would call during the week, and those calls were something else, real workouts, a great pleasure except for the irritant of his arrogance, which gnawed at me more and more. And our two trips to San Francisco, the second one a conscious farewell tour, as Ben waited silently, the two men unaware of each other. Ben has no money, beyond the psychiatric disability pension that he has received for almost a decade, which he strategically didn't reveal to me until weeks after our first sex, the true beginning of a relationship, the clincher. He hopes to become self-sustaining by making himself a professor of Sanskrit, an end that is years in the future, beyond the MA and PhD, which he can't earn at the University of Toronto, where Indology has been in steady decline for 20 years since the legendary implosion of its legendary Indian Studies Department. He has never openly said so, but it is implicitly clear that he intends to earn his two graduate degrees at Indian universities, against the advice of everyone he has asked, Indologists, both white and Indian, who have tried to make him understand that Indian universities, like the country itself, are shitholes of mediocrity. I could have told him that on the basis of what I know about the state of the world. If he were capable of being reasonable, if he were capable of actually using his potentially very great intelligence instead of choosing to be stupid and insane, then he would be aiming to earn these degrees at an American, British, or possibly a French or German university, which is the normal course for people in his field. He admitted to me that even the chair of South Asian Studies at the University of Toronto, an Indian, looked at him like he must be crazy when he insisted that he wanted to study at an Indian university. He told Ben that his best choice would be the University of Austin in Texas, which apparently now has one of the largest and best Indology departments in the world, a rich department that would completely take care of him, the chair said, and pay for him to spend periods of study in India the way normal PhD candidates in Indology do. But of course, he would never even dream of living in Texas, of all places. Anywhere in America would be bad enough. And of course, anything less than an Indian degree would not be sufficiently authentic for him, even though it would render him unemployable in the West. By now, it must be obvious to him that I will most certainly never set foot in India. For that matter, I would not move to Europe with him if he were to do his graduate degrees there, which he would at least consider, unlike America. 
For that matter, I would not move to Montreal or Vancouver with him, but if he were to do his degrees there, he could at least commute. I hope he's thinking about all this, unlikely in the extreme though that seems, because he could still save our relationship if he suddenly, miraculously started thinking reasonably, and I have to admit that I still hope that it can be saved. I have to hope. I have to face the fact that at this point in my life, it is very probably Ben or Solitude. Solitude is sweet to me and may be getting sweeter, but no, I need someone. Someone. But I've been reduced to this, a relationship with an unemployable maniac and parasite. In retrospect, it was a tremendous sacrifice to my pride, getting rid of David and Steve. Too tremendous. I was working on overcoming it, my pride, my intolerance of the humiliations David subjected me to, and of Steve's delusion that he was my equal. I was working on my impatience with their limitations, on lowering my expectations. A Pratyeka Buddha, a sage who attends enlightenment in solitude, is almost certainly doomed to a terrible loneliness for the remainder of her incarnation. I have to face the necessity of compromise. I shall not find my peer and soulmate. I shall not find another Buddha. In retrospect, a compromise with David and Steve's mediocrity might well have been easier and more generous to me than the one I now face. It would at least have, y have yielded access to a social situation that was worthy of me. What do I stand to gain now? Sex, love, residence in places that I don't want to go. Or separation from that which is desired. <laughs>